thank you all for coming on a weekend and uh, to those who are online and those who are here offline and it's really difficult to follow up on niharika's talk and i'm going to show you some figures and all that so it's going to be a complete opposite to what niharika showed and i hope i am able to take you along but i'm going to talk to you about something that is really close to uh, what, I, what i've been uh, what i really like to do and i'm really passionate about so i hope that uh, enthusiasm kind of covers up for all the boring figures that i show so our group as uh, he said we mostly work on hornbills and hornbills the scientific name is seros Buceros, Anthracoceros, and all that. So we've called ourselves Seros. It also loosely captures the work that we do, which is mostly community ecology. We do some ecological restoration, and we work in the Sahyadris and all that. So it broadly captures that. There's a name that students came up with, and uh, but we also work on other threatened animals. There is a PhD student who is working on the river birds, especially the white billed heron. We work on other threatened fruit eating and non fruit eating insectivorous birds and all that in the Western Ghats and Andamans, and in other places in Northeast India. We also started some work on uh, herpetofauna. Talking about herpetofauna, 20 years ago, I was just telling Ulasa also this that uh, 20 years ago, at this time, I was across the uh, August Himalay peak and I was sampling for amphibians. So my research journey started with amphibians, and I'm happy that I've, we've started some work on uh, amphibians and reptiles in the northern Western Ghats. And we broadly work on uh, hornbill ecology, evolution, plant to human interactions. impacts of anthropogenic activities in biodiversity and ecosystem process and we are also doing some ecological restoration work in the northern western ghats the research that we do is across multiple sites in the western ghats eastern himalaya indo myanmar region and sindha region and some of the hornbill work actually happens across these sites and we'll get a flavor of that in this talk i need to put the mic okay So I'm not audible. Yeah. Okay. So, but and these are some of the lab members. Uh, of course, these are the master students whose photos I've not put here. And some of the work that I'll be presenting is also of done by led by the researchers. Uh, some of the researchers. Today, what I'll be talking about is plant frugivore interactions and how uh, large-bodied frugivores like the hornbills play a really critical, important role in seed dispersal and how they are an integral part of this ecosystem. And just to give you an idea, just to start uh, with some basic things, you know, imagine a fruiting tree with no fruits on it. If all the fr fruits fall below the parent tree and none of the seeds get dispersed, it's like a buffet, right? And animals like rodents, pathogens, insects, they come and predate on the seeds. So a lot of seeds that fall under the parent tree basically end up dying. If some do manage to escape the predation and they do germinate, then of course there is competition that they do with because there are so many of of the same species and in a similar uh, population uh, age structure groups. And also then there is also pressures of herbivory not only from ungulates but also from invertebrates and other uh, pathogens. So if the seed doesn't get dispersed, the probability that the seed survives. And becomes a seedling, and that seedling becomes a tree, becomes extremely low. And this is something that was captured by Janssen and Connell in the hypothesis that they came up with in 1970s. And here you see on the x-axis, which is the distance from the parent tree, and on the y-axis is the probability. And they said that the chance that a seed arrives in the forest floor as you move away from the mother plant actually declines. Right. However, the chance that a seed or the seedling survives as you move away from the parent tree actually increases. And so, somewhere where the two curves intersect is where you should have maximum fruit. So, even if you go into these forests here, you will see that the two neighboring trees, often unless it's a plantation, are often of different species, right? So, though a lot of seeds are falling near the parent tree, often the two neighboring trees that you have would be of different species, and that's because of a lot of density-dependent or distance-dependent impacts that happen, and that result in a lot of mortality. Now this phenomenon explains the importance of why the seeds have to escape away from the parent plants. Now there have been a lot of studies that have overwhelmingly demonstrated the impact, the influence of the ambulatorial or the pervasive effects of distance and density dependent mortality. And this is a meta-analysis which shows that there are distance effects, there are density effects, and a 
across tropical and temperate regions, you see that if the seeds occur in high densities or if the seeds are near the parent plant, there is greater mortality of seeds. And the chances that the seed survive or the seedling survives are actually very low. Now, let me take you to the forest of the eastern Himalaya, right? And then if you go happen to walk into this forest in the low elevation forest of the eastern Himalaya, you may encounter as many as about 40 to 50 species of fruit eating birds. And they vary in size from the smallest bird, which is around 10 grams, to the largest bird, which can weigh up to 4 kilograms. Right? So we have the hornbills, we have the imperial pigeons, we have the green pigeons, the barbets, fairy bluebirds, bluebirds, and higher up. Most of these groups that I'm talking about are also in your backyard. We went for birding in the morning and we saw most representatives of the most group. And again, other thing that I want you to notice for every group, there are multiple species. So there are three species of hornbills, two species of pigeons, four species of green pigeons, four species of barbets, six species of bulbuls that sympatrically occur. And so these birds that I'm showing here are uh, a subset of 50, 40 species of fruit eating birds. And you can see that there is a great diversity of it. And all of these birds are feeding on fruits and dispersing the seeds in tropical uh, in these forests and helping the plants regenerate. And so if you were to sit and observe the trees, or if you were to sit and observe what the birds were feeding on, you would get a network like this. Right now, let me break the network into smaller parts. So on the top, the boxes that you see of varying sizes are the species. So every box is a bird. And on the bottom that you see are the plant species. The list of the plants and the free fruitier species are given here. And these are, this is actually a real network. So we sat and observed these 43 different species of plants and we recorded what bird comes and feeds on it. And then we've seen, okay, we've seen this bird, the black bulbul coming and feeding on this particular species of phyca so many times. And then the thickness of the lines that connect the plants and the birds indicates how many times you've seen them interacting, right? And what you see here, it's a complex mesh, right? And what you also see, is that the small body Fuji was there, the size of their boxes are large. That is, they are really dominating the community in terms of the interactions. Number of times that you see a bird feeding on a fruit, they are the real ones who are dominating. And the large body Fuji was, like the imperial pigeon and the hornbills are somewhere in the middle. Right? So their frequency of interactions, how many times we have seen them feeding on fruits, is actually quite less compared to the small body Fuji was. So therefore, one may argue that, okay, there are so many species of birds and you have the small body species of birds, which are so common and they are also interacting a lot with plants. And why do we really need the large body? Do we really need them in these forests? Do we have these communities which are just overpacked and is there functional redundancy? Now, this is something that has also attracted a lot of recent attention. And there has been a lot of papers that have been suggesting that probably there is functional redundancy. That you have too many frugios and then basically some of them, even if they go missing, it's fine. And then this paper basically talks about the effectiveness of the role that different frugio species play in seed dispersal. And so here you have the body mass, right? So it's in log scale. And you have the effectiveness as a seed disperser that these birds play. And you can see that what this paper seems to suggest is that it is somewhere around about 10 to 100 grams at the bird maximum. Uh, you know, effectively they are doing all the work and really large body fluvials are really not required in terms of effectiveness. These they have shown for two different kinds of plants, which are berries. To give an example of a berry, a grape is a berry. And then there are groups like a jamun fruit as a group. So for two different kinds of fruits, they have shown this and they show that, okay, this small size frugivores can really be useful. Now, my talk is going to be focused on hornbills. Now, do we really need the hornbills then? You know, they are large body frugivores. They come about somewhere here, say, four kilos. Right? And so we do really need them in these forests and whether they're, the role that they are playing are functionally redundant. But this is an important question to ask because, you know, our fra forests are getting fragmented, right? Our, uh, these fragmented forests often negatively impact large-bodied animals like the hornbills. And so basically, if you are able to show that their role is redundant, then we can say that, okay, even the small-bodied bulbuls and barbets that survive in these forests can potentially compensate for the role that hornbills play. Now, if hornbills are really playing an important role, or large frugivore um, are playing an important role, then they should play an indispensable quantitative and qualitative role in seed dispersal. I'll come to what is quantitative and qualitative role slightly later. And then, if they are playing an important role, if they go missing from the forest, 
then it should have an impact on the plant communities. On the other hand, if small bodied fujiwas are playing an important role in the community, if the small bodied fujiwas go missing, then it should have a role that the large bodied fujiwas are not able to play, and then there will be again consequences for the plant communities. And if they matter, if large fujiwas are really mattering, then they will they really matter. Then if what kind of act, human activities and what impacts they're having on large fujiwas, something that also needs to be understood. And this is going to be broadly the organization of my talk today. And I'm going to focus on large birds, which are large birds, I mean birds that are greater than 100 grams, and I'm mostly going to focus on hornbills. So hornbills, again, are just talking about birds which are larger than 700 grams. Now, hornbills themselves are really fascinating birds, right? They have large, they are amongst the largest fruit-eating birds in the tropical forests. They're found in Africa and Asia. All, most of the Asian hornbills are frugivorous, and uh, they can weigh up to 4 kilograms. And the really unique thing about their uh, biology and ecology is their feeding pattern. So here you have a great hornbill on the top here on the left, and you can see it's at a nest. So the female is sitting inside the nest cavity here, and she has seen the nest cavity with, with her own feces. And she will be there for almost the better part of four months. About three months and one week, she'll be there inside. And the male will single-handedly bring fruits and to feed the female and the chicks. In the case of the rufous snake and the wreath hornbill, the female is there right in the end. Just when the chick fledges or comes out of the nest, till that time the female is with the chick. So the female rufous neck and wreath hornbills can spend up to four weeks, four months inside the nest cavity. The smaller Malabar grey hornbill, which is found in the campus here, can the female spends about three weeks. Their breeding starts now. This is their breeding season starts now in February. So they have really unique breeding biology. They are predominantly fruit-eating birds. Up to ninety percent of the diet is fruits, right? So they they are really uh, uh, helping a lot of forest plants to regenerate. Is something that I will show in this talk. Now here, what I have plotted is the same fifty-three different species of frugivores in the eastern Himalaya. I went to the museum and measured their gape widths, how wide the beaks are, right? Because the gape width is important because it determines what size of fruits that they can swallow. Right? And then that also determines what kind what size of seeds that they are able to disperse in the forest. And so you have a larger handle here, the gape width, which is the width of the beak. On the x-axis is a simple histogram. And you can see that the larger handles are somewhere here at the right extreme. Most of the birds have beak sizes which are around 20 in size, right? So most birds in the forest have small beaks and there are very few birds like the hornbills which have very, very large beaks, right? And so that is one thing that I want to remember. So there is the large beak, large body birds themselves are very few in the tropical forest. Now let's come to the quantitative and qualitative role of hornbills. Now let's see dispersal effectiveness. How effective a fujiwara is in dispersing seeds is something that was uh, articulated by Shu, and uh, they said that basically we have to look at the quantitative role and the qualitative role, and based on that is something that we can determine the effectiveness. So what's the quantitative role? How many fruits, how many times the bird visits the tree, right? How many seeds are dispersed per visit? So basically a bird that is playing an important role, quantitative role, should be visiting very often and should be eating a lot of fruits and removing a lot of seeds when it visits the fruit. The qualitative uh, role is the kind of treatment the seed gets when it is in the gut of the animal. For example, certain green pigeons, right? Green pigeons, too, they are also here around. And when they feed, because pigeons, they have gizzards, right? And gizzards are stones. So when they feed on fruits, a lot of the seeds get damaged. They get destroyed in the gizzard, right? And therefore, the quality of treatment that the seeds get when it is in the gut of a green pigeon is debated. Right? So that is also something that has to be determined and where they are depositing seeds. Right? If they deposit the seeds at sites which are not suitable for germination, not suitable for the plant to grow, then there are no point. They are playing a very poor qualitative role in seed dispersal. Now something that I will talk about the number, quantity and quality of deposition, but I will not go into quality of treatment because that is something that has already been demonstrated for hornbills, that hornbills do not damage the seeds, be it the largest seeds of canarium or very tiny seeds of ficus. They don't have a gizzard on that. And so they don't damage the seeds at all. In fact, in certain species, the germination rates, right, they are actually enhanced because of the gut treatment that they get in on this gut. 
and therefore uh, on this the quality of treatment that the seeds get is is already been demonstrated to be very very good now if you have to look at how the different fujiwas are playing a role in the community you can look at the quantity of seed dispersal so this is like a map and you map the different fujiwas on this landscape it's called the seed dispersal effectiveness landscape if you want me to slow down you please let me know and i can slow down and i can explain certain things here it is the quantity of dispersal right so the birds that are here they are dispersing a lot of seeds birds that are on the right side of the figure right they feed a lot of fruits and it disperses a lot of seeds so they are playing a very important quantity role in seed dispersal on the y axis you know the quality of seed dispersal and so birds that are on the top right they are giving a very high quality either treatment gut treatment or the sites in which they are depositing the seeds right so if you have birds like this at the bottom left they are not dispersing too many seeds and the quality of dispersal also is very very poor so they are not playing a very effective role in seed dispersal on the other hand you have birds on the top right corner right which are dispersing a lot of seeds and the quality of treatment that the seeds get is also very very high right and so basically what the purpose of this is to map out all these birds species and see where hornbills lie if hornbills are really playing an important role then they should be on the top right and the birds that don't play an important role should be at the bottom left and so this data that i am going to present is from two sites in the eastern himalaya right there's paki tiger reserve with the eastern himalaya virus the hotspot and the mandafa tiger reserve which is at the junction of the eastern himalaya and the indo myanmar virus the hotspot and namdafa is a very beautiful place with over an area of 2000 square kilometers having an elevation gradient from about 400 meters above sea level to 4500 meters above sea level this was my phd site lot of hornbills you know it has amongst the highest density of hornbills in inland entire mainland asia there are no other sites that have reported such high densities of hornbills as they are reported in namdafa and so what we did is we sat in the fruiting trees of five different large seeded species right and we focused on these large seeded species because of multiple reasons large seeded species have you know other roles also that they play you know they are relatively smaller it's easier to watch them logistically also it is easier because you know it's not like you have hundreds of birds flocking and all that and visiting and all that and other thing is also we are able to then estimate how many fruits they are removing when the birds are coming when they are going and stuff like that and so we focused on species like the canarium canarium is also found here canarium is something that we use dhupa no the dhupa that we use is uh, it's from that this is the resin of that canarium tree and so what we found here is that most of the other fuji were right you know the bottom there for these five species that we observed and hornbills were in fact the only seed dispersers of these five large seeded plants right and this is something that we again replicated in other site in paki tiger reserve with now more species of plants so basically what we're doing is we go early in the morning sit in the fruiting tree and record what birds come how many fruits they feed on and when they come and they go and stuff like that and again you can see here that the hornbill is the right at the top the wrho and the grho are the great hornbill the great hornbill the imperial pigeons are somewhere in the middle and the bobbits are somewhere at the bottom left because the seeds are very large bobbit cannot swallow it so either it drops a lot of seeds or it pecks on the pulp right so if you have a large seeded plant what we can do is we can peck on the pulp and get nutrition so you don't have to solve the seed it's like cheating right it's like nectar robbery right so you're just feeding on the pulp but not doing any service and that's what often smaller birds like barbets do and these large seeded plants also again I'll come back later on and I'll talk about them is that they are also having they are also having high wood density some of these plants are also have playing other functional roles in terms of carbon sequestration and stuff like that so this was where i demonstrated that okay from large seeded species of plants the hornbills are really really important and there are not other animals that are able to disperse the seeds in all the second part that we were really interested in is how many seeds are on this dispersed in these forests right and so we what we did is again this was a study that was carried out in nandapa tiger reserve and the hornbill plateau is where we did the study we had eight trails there and we put out these one meter by one meter plots and we recorded how many seeds come in those right and we again focused on these large seeded plants which are predominantly dispersed by hornbills so we had demonstrated that hornbills are dispersing these plants now let's see how many seeds are arriving on those plots and then we will know how many seeds are getting out of the dispersing in these forests 
and so these plots were monitored every 15 days right and what we found was that hondas are dispersing up to about 12000 seeds per day per square kilometer and these uh, are basically day in and day out hondas are basically farming that's why they're called gardeners of the forest they're just spreading seeds in the forest now let me remind you that these are only the large seeded fruits uh, that i'm talking about right hondas are also feeding on figs every fig fruit may have anywhere between 25 to 50 seeds right and so you can imagine the number of seeds that hondas are dispersing just to put things in perspective you know these places also have high density of hondas so when i'm saying 12000 seeds in those sites the densities of hondas would be as much as 100 birds per square kilometer right there are these flocks of wheat hondas you know in which come in you have those large ficus on which 50 birds last november when i was in andhra we were watching 50 birds descend on that tree and they feed on those fruits and other and disperse the seeds so it's really fascinating to watch these birds coming and feeding on the fruits and dispersing the seeds and so both years we saw that wherever there are more hondas more seeds are arriving in those same patches right and therefore we demonstrated that hondas are really playing an important role in even influencing where the seeds are getting dispersed in the forest so all this while i'm talking about hondas and all that let's see the larger community itself and how the community itself is organized right and so i come back to this real network of the uh, which was generated from packet algorithm and what we did is we then looked at which plant species and which frugivore species are interacting a lot with each other and then those species get classified as separate compartments so you have a bunch of plant species and bunch of frugivore species they form separate compartments so basically this is the entire community and that community is then organized into separate separate divisions for example the icer you have the physical biological sciences physical uh, physics and chemistry and stuff like that right so even there the community is broadly organized into different different sub communities and that's what we found so there were four different communities that were very distinct so we did this network analysis and we seen membership of the species whether the bird ends up in the same group or not and for four of the five groups we had consistent membership and so the first group that is the group a as all the large body frugivores right like the hondas and all that they form a separate group in the entire community and this group is also the one that when, when you look at the plants there are there is just to give you an example this is a seed of the tomato right and that is a ficus seed so basically just to give you a perspective this seed was photographed under a ficus tree so hondas had come and dispersed the seed when it was coming and feeding on the ficus right so the fallen fruit of ficus is there and the seed is there. and so uh, you can get an idea of the scale of difference right between the uh, ficus and the canarium seed and again what you see is that the group a which has the large body frugivores like the hondas also has the large seeded plants which is shown in the dark bar here right so the group a has mostly the large seeded plants so you basically have a separate sub community of large body frugivores and large seeded plants so talking about redundancy clearly there is not a redundancy because these birds and the plants in a subset of plants are themselves forming different groups right and so if hondas are lost these large uh, seeded plants can be expected to be negatively impacted you have the ficuses which sit in the small group right the small seeded plants and that also has the green pigeons green pigeons really love ficuses right so that group also had that green pigeons i hope everyone is with me yeah okay and so the other thing that we also noticed was that when we looked at the number of partners that the uh plants has right because that is also so how many species of birds come and feed on uh, large seeded plants how many species of birds come and feed on small seeded plants on average so you have the ficuses right see almost 20 uh, 20 different species are coming and feeding on that but you have large seeded plants less than five species of birds are So this group of large seeded plants are almost completely dependent on these um, on these large body frugivores, right? Yeah. On the other hand, when you look at the frugivores themselves, you see that the large body frugivores are at the second. The intermediate body frugivores are feeding on lots of plant species, but large body frugivores are feeding second in in the ranking. That they have right so if the the large seeded plants are extreme specialists 
while the large body fujiwas are kind of semi luminous right so they all because large body fujiwas it's not like large body fujiwas are only feeding on large seed plants they are also going and feeding on medium and small seed plants and therefore they are semi luminous so this part of it now i'll move to the next part where back to the word hello Okay. So now, after this part, we've shown that hornbills and large seeded plants they are forming a different group. They it's not that they are playing a different role now. Now let's move to the qualitative aspect of seed dispersal. And one of the qualitative aspects is something called as the scatter and clump dispersal. And let me explain what scatter and clump dispersal is. So what has happened here is that a deer has fed on fruits of Dominaria melanica, and our soil, and it has come and sat and it has dispersed, regurgitated those seeds. It went and fed under a fruiting tree. It moved away from the fruiting tree, sat somewhere to take rest, and while it was taking rest, it has regurgitated the seeds of uh, those Dominaria melanica. Right. This, on the other hand, is actually. A photo that is a freshly dispersed seed. We were sitting and watching a fruiting tree, right? And this hornbill, great hornbill, came and sat right above on the tree above us. It regurgitated the seed of the palm called the bistone. It dropped that seed and flew away, right? So you have a scenario where a lot of seeds are again dispersed together. That's called the clump dispersal. And you have a scenario where a single seed is being dispersed, which is the scatter dispersal. right yeah so you basically have again possibility of competition again possibility of predation now will happen there is long dispersal but less chances of predation and because a single seed in the forest floor is less likely to be detected by a rodent or get infected by a pathogen and so if an animal is doing mostly scatter dispersal it is desirable because it is actually spreading out the seeds even in the forest Now you remember I talked about the breeding biology of the hummingbirds. The female is inside, the male is coming and feeding the fruits. They are particularly uh, careful about the hygiene that the female has. So in fact, yesterday in the morning I had gone because one of my students is looking at phylogeography of the great hummingbird, so he's collecting poop samples from the female. And it's amazing that they, you know, they, even that thin slit, you know, they will basically they are pooping and all that happens outside. So inside the nest they keep it clean. And so the female, all the seeds and all that that it feeds, fruits that it feeds, and all the seeds and all that are dropped outside. Now for four months the female is sitting inside, right? So all the seeds pile up under the nest tree, right? Yeah. Now one thing that I also wanted to mention is that I use the term regurgitation and regurgitation. Right? So for hornbills, when you have large seeds like the canarium, they regurgitate the seed, but tiny seeds of phytas are defecated. Right, so then the defecation is then used to also seed the nest cavity, right? And so if you see the seeding, you know that the 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 thing sometimes chips and falls below the nest. You will see that it will have tiny ficus seeds. And especially when they are nest seeding, the male hornbill will feed a lot of ficus because it makes it very sticky, right? And so the basically what come back to that means that if the nest cavity is here, a lot of seeds are going to get in there, so it's going to be clump dispersal. So that's not something that is desirable. Right, and so what you see here is my PhD advisor Aparnita. She actually counted how many seeds and seedlings come, and she found that uh, so this is in the front of the nest, right? And the cavity is there. How many seedlings of fungi plants are there in the front, and then at the back, how many seedlings are there? And you can clearly see that okay, there are hardly any seeds falling behind, so there are no seedlings behind, but right? a lot of seedlings are there in the front of the nest, right? Where the female is actually throwing out the seeds. Right? Now, when you go from seedling to sapling, that difference that you see, right, the red arrow that you can see, the effect size that you can see from almost only about thousand seedlings or whatever unit that is, to about seventy thousand that are there in the front of this, that was probably hectares. That effect of seedlings, when you look at the sapling stage, that effect is gone because a lot of mortality happens. High clump dispersal, right? Lot of seeds accumulating, though they are germinating, 
their competition or herbivory is in there. So whatever initial advantage that the plum dispersal gives is actually over a period of time negated and you can see that there is hardly any difference by the sapling stage. So clearly at the nest hornbills are not doing Similarly at the roost sites, you know, so hornbills also come in communally used. So this roost for example has been there for 20, 30, 25 years that people have been watching. Hornbills keep coming here and sleeping, roosting, right? And so even today they would have come by this time and they would be roosting here, right? On this uh, riverside, used to be And so again under the roost tree, again there will be a lot of sleeping that will happen today. And similar problem will happen, right? So again, clump dispersal happening at the nest side and the roost side. But you have to remember for that full day, hornbills are moving in the forest, right? So that time they are doing plum dispersal, right? And so it is also important to determine how many, what proportion of seeds are dispersed by the male birds. By the male is not who's nesting inside, right? And it comes to the female and leaves. So at the nest, what proportion of seeds are dispersed by males? And also at the roost sites, what proportion of seeds get dispersed, right? And that's something that we wanted to find out. So that really, this is something that we are going into the qualitative aspects of the seed dispersal, right? We discussed number of seeds that they disperse. Now we're looking at where they are dispersing the seeds, the deposition sites. And so for this, what we, we did is for two years, we put aerial nests in Papi Tiger River and we tried to catch these birds. Very smart birds, very sharp vision they have. They are amongst the earliest birds who come and uh, start feeding and all that. So they really go at 3 a.m. and put these nests out. They are a lovely team of uh, local uh, local that we had at daytime uh, learned so much about hornbills just while trying to catch them. And so during this, when we caught these hornbills and we put these GPS tags on those birds. And we basically recorded every 15 minutes where the bird was moving to get really fine scale information of how the birds are moving. And two of my colleagues, Akansha and Ushma, they, uh, they collected fruits from the forest, they packed them in an ice box. They would drive to the Nagaland uh, Zoological Park and then they would feed the fruits to the hornbills there in captivity. And then wait for determining what time do the hornbills take to regurgitate the seeds. Right? So they did this for multiple species. They did it for three and six seeds of five species. And across multiple trials they fed. And they found that between 90 to 150 minutes is the time that a hornbill takes to regurgitate a seed. It feeds on the fruit, it removes the entire pulp inside. The pulp is the nutrition. Then it throws the seed out. It takes about 90 to 150 minutes, right? So for every seed, we had how much time the hornbill is taking to regurgitate the seed. And from the GPS tags, we had how the hornbill is moving in the forest. And we integrated that to information and we developed this seed dispersal kernels. Right? Now let me show you, explain what the seed dispersal kernels are. These are basically distance categories from the parent tree. So we said that anything that falls from 0 to 20 meters is below the parent tree because the trees in this forest are very large. They have wide canopy and all that. And there could be also some GPS error. So we said anything between 20 meters, we'll say it has fallen into the parent tree. First thing that you notice is that the probability of the seed falling below the parent tree is only 2%. For so the big thumbnail, and it's only about less than whatever, you know, around 5% for the great. So the male hornbills, these were only the male birds that were tagged, right? So the male hornbills are hardly dispersing any seeds at the, under the parent tree. So they are taking most of the seeds away from the parent tree. Now we knew the location of the nests of these birds, right? Where the birds were nesting. So we said, okay, tell us whether, how, whether, what proportion of seeds ended up under the nest tree. And that's shown in the black box. And you can see that those black bars are even more tinier. So, Hornbills are hardly dispersing any seeds under the nest trees. These are the male birds that I'm talking about. Females are actually, of course, doing a lot of dispersal under the nest tree, but uh, males are hardly dispersing any seeds under the nest tree. Right? Other thing that you want to also look at is, especially with this, is that they're doing a lot of long distance seed dispersal. So, there is a probability that a seed goes up to about 9 to 10 kilometers away from the parent. Why is this important? Climate change is happening. Plants have to move. Animals are their agents. So it is through birds like hornbills that these plants have a chance to move into more favorable areas. There could be fragmented forests. Hornbills can take seeds between those fragmented forests and ensure gene flow. Right? So these long distance seed dispersal, not many birds can do again. Not many animals can do themselves. 
hornbills really fly over large distances and therefore they are able to also disperse seeds quite a distance away from the parent plant right probably change the mind yeah yeah okay similarly when we did the analysis of what proportion of seeds are getting dispersed under the roost sites you can see the lighter bar there on the top is the proportion of seeds at the roost again a very very less than 10% of the seeds are getting dispersed at the roost site because they are feeding early in the morning and whole day they are dispersing the seeds it's only the evening bout that they feed on that comes at the roost right and so therefore you again see that mostly hornbills are doing scatter dispersal in the forest in the daytime they are not dispersing the male hornbills definitely are not dispersing at the nest and even at the roost sites only a tiny proportion of seeds come so hornbills are doing good quality seed dispersal is something also that we demonstrate now let's look at what happens when hornbills go missing now i have made a case that hornbills are really important if they are really so important then if they go missing from the forest there should be some impact on the plant communities right and so what we did is again we conducted the study in eastern himalaya where there is a lot of hunting of hornbills and also there is a lot of logging that happens now a lot of these large seeded plant that i spoke about they also have high wood density so they are also important timber species so they are also harvested quite a bit right and so these are the two major threats that hornbills face in the eastern himalaya and so when we looked at the number of trees per hectare right and these are basically of the hornbill food plants so we know because we were studying hornbills in that area we know what they are feeding on and then we took a working plan of the forest department and then we classified the plants into those that are targeted by logging those that are not targeted by logging right and the ficus trees right spangler figs they have milky latex so people who they don't prefer it for logging at all because very difficult to cut it becomes very sticky right so nobody is talking about logging ficus right and so first thing that you see is that if you classify the hornbill food plants into those that are targeted by logging and those that are not targeted by logging you will realize immediately if you just compare the less disturbed sites where there is no logging no hunting and you look at the number of trees per hectare so most of the trees that hornbills feed on are targeted by logging as compared to those that are not logged and the ficuses ficuses are inherently rare in the community and so most of the hornbill food plants are targeted by logging right that is something that is evident here and what happens is where there is more logging there is automatically a drastic reduction in these food plants right and so logging also depletes the availability of food for these hornbills right and what you also see when you look at the densities of hornbills themselves in heavily disturbed sites where there is hunting and where there is logging you hardly see any hornbills there right you see hornbills in the less disturbed sites these are for different months december january and february and you see that in the less disturbed sites always there are high densities of hornbills compared to the heavily disturbed sites which have both logging and hunting now when you look at how many seeds arrive in the forest floor right and these are the same plots that we used we just spoke about this 1 meter by 1 meter plots where we recorded how many seeds come you see that hardly any seeds are coming in the heavily disturbed site where there is a lot of logging and hunting right so these are again seeds of those food, hornbill food plants right large seeded hornbill food plants so clearly loss of hornbills is having an impact on the number of seeds that arrive in these forests and what you also see is that the recruitment gets impacted <coughs> so we also don't see for these important hornbill food plant species which we are actually there and we we see that there is hardly any recruitment happening now phoebe is also a very important timber species people use it to construct their houses and all that it's a high timber value also so loss of hornbills and excessive logging can basically result in you know impacts on future uh, use by humans itself right and so basically what i'm showing here is that when hornbills are lost it has cascading impacts on the regeneration of plants right mediated through poor dispersal of seeds right so clearly showing that when hornbills are lost it has an impact on the community so we should also see when what happens when hornbills are only when that remain or large body fusion is the only thing that remain and when small body fusions are remain now that's a bit difficult to do right because hunting will typically target larger animals and all that so it's easier to find when large body animals are lost but what do you do when small body animals are removed from system 
So what we did is we went to this Arkandam island. Arkandam is an oceanic island. It's basically an extinct volcano. It's in the Andaman archipelago. From the main Andaman archipelago, it's about 150 meters, 150 kilometers, right? And so the beauty of this island is that it only has large body fluids. It's a 6.8 square kilometer island. It only has the large body frugivores and the tiny frugivores like the, the smaller body frugivores like the bulbuls, very bluebird and the barbet are not present on that island. And so this gave us an opportunity to see what happens when the small body frugivores are not there, but the large body frugivores are there. So here, this is a Narcondam hornbill. Narcondam hornbill is only found in that one particular Narcondam island somewhere, nowhere else. Right? It's a point endemic species. It's classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. About 1,000 birds exist. That's the population of the estimated. And along with Narcondam hornbills, of course, there are these imperial pigeons, right? That are also there on the island, which again are mostly about 500 grams in size. And you can see that they're quite large in size. What you see here is that unlike the mainland community where hornbills are amongst the rarest, on the island, the hornbills are amongst the most. So here I'm talking about the population of these birds, it's about 1,000 birds that we estimated using distance sampling. And it's the second most abundant bird is the Asian quail, which is about 250 birds that we're talking about. And there are two species of Asian quail, again about 250 birds. And what you see here in the community is that the hornbill is completely dominated. So the community is completely flipped, right? You remember the mainland community, right? Where the hornbills are somewhere in the middle and I'll show it to you here. The hornbills are there in the middle, but here on the island it's completely flipped. The hornbills are really dominating and they continue to play a very important role in the dispersal of large seeded plants. All the species that are shown with the arrow here, they are all the large seeded plants. And you can see that only the hornbills are feeding on them. Hardly any of the other Fujiwas are feeding on them. It's really interesting that the pigeons, the imperial pigeons, on the mainland we only see them feeding on large seeded plants. And this I am talking based on our experience in the Western Ghats. It's based on multiple sites in the Eastern Himalaya and all that. You only see imperial pigeons mostly feeding on large seeded plants on the mainland. But on the island, in the absence of the small bodied frugivores, they are feeding mostly on the small seeded plants. Right? So it's really interesting what is happening on these islands as well. And what we also see is the dietary shifts. Now, this is a species of Cadicarpa, very tiny fruits and tiny seeds. On the mainland, when we did tree watches on Cadicarpa, we never saw hornbills coming and feeding. But bulbuls and barbets, they come and feed on it quite a lot. On the island, Calicarpa is present, but bulbuls and barbets are not present. And we saw the Narcondam hornbill going and feeding on that fruits of the Calicarpa. Right? So basically, if the last small bodied frugivores are not there, large bodied frugivores are able to play the role. But if the large bodied frugivores are not there, small bodied frugivores are not able to compensate for this. So this again shows the importance of the large bodied frugivores in the community right so i think i have convinced to you now that hornbills and large bodied fujiwas are not playing a redundant role in the community they play a very distinct and unique role which is irreplaceable now let's see what impacts are humans having on hornbills right and so as part of my phd and of course uh, later on as a part of my postdoctoral research something that we did was we did surveys across these five states six states in our northeast india Including Arunachal. Arunachal I did during my PhD, but postdoctoral research I did for Assam, Nigare, Tripura, Mishra. The hornbills are inherently there. Today in the morning we went, we didn't see the hornbills. We saw the bluebird, barbet, everything else we saw, very bluebird and all but we didn't hear the hornbill and all that. So they're in, in mainland ecosystems, hornbills are not the most abundant and all that. But they are culturally very important, especially when you go to Eastern one. Here you can see the Nishi tribesman. He is wearing the cask of the great hornbill. Right, so hunters are able to easily identify all the species of hornbills because they they use the body parts of the hornbill. Here you have the Mancho tribesmen, which are closely related to Nagas. They are also using the great hornbill tail feathers, right? And so hornbills are very integral to the local community. A lot of hunting is also prevalent in this region. And so if you go and talk to hunters, they are able to tell you because if you have to walk in the forest, you can keep walking and keep walking, but you hardly detect hornbills because they are hunted so extensively. But if you talk to the hunters, they will tell you when have they seen the bird, whether they have seen it in the last one year, five years ago and all that or not. And that's what the data we collected. We went and spoke to hunters and elders in the village and all that and forest department staff and all that. And we conducted 700 interviews in the entire northeastern region, except Manipur. And we conducted 
expected presence absence information and based on that using occupancy sampling we generated this distribution map to the on bill i'm just showing one species here the first net one now if you see the icm website and all that it will show that the distribution is like this it will show very very then you will think that okay this bird must be there forests are there in northeast and all that and so this bird must be quite widely distributed but the reality is that only the darker regions right the dark cults are the great set of high probability of occupancy of these birds right and you can see that it's hardly restricted to small pockets of northeast india right so basically most places they've gone <coughs> locally extinct you can already imagine what kind of cascading influences it is having on the plant community itself similar stuff we are observing in other parts of india and southeast asia so this is data from the western northern western ghats this is a student master student master thesis and she looked at of course a whole lot of bird that i am only showing the hornbill part here and so she did survey in the maharashtra part of the western ghats about 15000 square kilometers we sampled she sampled reserve forests degraded private forests rubber plantations cashew plantations and mango plantations and you can clearly see that the two parts one is that the low elevation forests are really critical the probability of occurrence of the malava grey one is very high in low elevation forests by low elevation forests i mean the forest that are here and in the degraded forests, habitat degradation in the secondary forest, the probability of occurrence is low. And of course, it is very low in the cashew mango and rubber plantations. So both degradation and conversion of forests is negatively impacting hornbills. A student was working as uh, you know in Thailand as well, because Thailand we have the helmeted hornbill crisis. Helmeted hornbill is a critical endangered hornbill. It's very unique. It's closely related to great hornbill, but the cask of the helmeted hornbill is like ivory. The great hornbill cask is all, you know, very, uh, it's actually porous from inside, very hollow. But the cask of the helmeted hornbill is actually like hybrid. And for that reason, these birds were hunted because they want to make some exhibits out of it. So they carve the cask out and all that as exhibits, as display items. And for that, the bird was been literally pushed to critically endangered status. So it's very, very difficult to go and see these birds. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is was to also estimate the density. It's very, very low, as you can see here. And also we compared a degraded site. You know, we did this in two sites. One is the Bala Wildlife Sanctuary, and another is the Budo uh, region. And the Budo has logging and all that has happening. So there is some bit of disturbance there. Again, you can see that we hardly have any detection in the helmet rumble. Helmet rumble is generally, originally it was the commonest rumble in the region. But now it's really been pushed to extinction. Most regions. And even for the rhinoceros and the reef hornbill, you can see that in the disturbed forest, their densities are dropping. So we looked at degradation. Here, there is some bit of selective felling that is also negatively impacting on this. And of course, habitat conversion is also negatively impacting on this. And these are case studies from different parts of Asia, from Northeast India, Western Ghats, and from Southeast Asia. I think I would have convinced you by now that they are playing an indispensable quantitative and qualitative role in seed dispersal. When they are removed, it impacts the plant regeneration, especially of the large seeded plants. When small sujivos are removed, large sujivos are able to compensate for them. They are able to come and disperse those large seeds and all that. And humans are having through different kinds of activities, degradation, hunting, logging, all of these are having negative impacts on hornbills. And so basically, hornbills are playing a functionally unique and complementary role. They are irreplaceable. Again, I want to really emphasize that as quantitative and qualitative role in seed dispersal. And uh, one thing that I want to end this talk with is basically what is the implication of all of this, right? And so this is a very neat uh, paper that talks about what is the impact of interaction on diversification. And they look at different kinds of interactions. So you have the mutualisms, provincialism, and here where the diversification rates are increased, and you can clearly see what mutualism, seed dispersal that we're talking about, because the plant benefits because of moving away, seed moves away from the parent plant, right? And the animal also benefits from the nutrition of the animal. So clearly, mutualisms have a positive impact on the diversification rates. And you can see that angiosperms and animals and other they are playing a very important role, right? In itself, in uh, the focal taxon that you look at, itself for mutualisms itself, they are having an important role in those aspects. All of this work was supported by a lot of funding agencies. So this is a uh, part of my 
PhD to postdoctoral work and the work that we're doing now. And it's been supported by a bunch of organizations. I want to thank them for that. A lot of people who mentored me, who helped me in the field, who been friends, all of them, I want to thank all of them. And I want to thank all of you, Aisip Trivandrum, for inviting me. So, thanks, everyone. I hope you like the talk. And these, if you want to go and check whatever I said is right or wrong, you can refer to some of these papers. Uh, that basically the results of which are presented. And if you want to contact me, my email address is there. Thanks a lot. I hope I kept time. Yeah. So we can take questions now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, of course, I didn't go into details. I'm sorry about that because I wanted to talk a lot about topics. But basically, a dispersed seed will not have pulp, right? So, the pulp will not be there on the fruit, uh, on the seed. So, that is one indication through which you will know that it's a dispersed seed. Second is that uh, it is away from the parent plant, right? So, it is dispersed. So, any seed that is away from the parent plant is what is considered. So only if you find a seed which is away from the parent plant, it would be considered as a dispersed seed. Yeah. Human activities, mean what? Yeah. So, so fragmentation, one of the things that it uh, See the thing, when we look at, I estimated this based on some of the data and I triangulated it. I just wanted to find out how many trees are there, no fruiting trees at a time for hornbills in one hectare of patch, right? And it would be about two to three fruiting trees that a hornbill would have in the lean season in one hectare, right? Now, if you have fragments, so basically there's a lot of time that goes flying between patches, right? And hornbills also have to keep searching for fruiting plants. So there's one or two hectares. In a hectare, there are about 600 trees on average in a minimum rainforest or at least 600 trees. In that 600, it has to find those three trees that are fruiting, right? And then if you have habitat fragmentation, then it has to move between the patches and find it. So a lot of, it's also a lot of energy intensive. And so possibly what happens is they start ignoring these smaller fragments when fragmentation happens. It's been one of my things that I wanted to really do is because Valparai offers a lovely setup where there are good hornbill population. One of the things that I really wanted to do is to tag hornbills and see how they move, right? In these forest types. It's a lovely place because you also need hornbills in good numbers there. Catch them is not easy over two years. So, but then coming back to your question, that it's just that it makes finding those shooting trees very difficult. And probably that's what. And their home ranges are two square kilometers. And you have fragments of one hectare, two hectares, tens of hectares and all that. Then it has to keep moving between these patches. And most of the intermediate parts between the patches are often not very friendly environments. You, know, you hardly get like in tea and all that, you will have, have silver oak. None of it is useful for the hunt. So then uh, search time. And also what one of my students, Pooja, for a master's dissertation she did, she found that the diets of hornbills in the more fragmented forests are actually different from those in the fire, in the continuous forest. Also, diversity of food items is less. So all of these factors come into play, and therefore, you know, you will see that fragmentation is negatively impacting on this. Yeah. 
How are the? Sympatric, right? In the Northeast, I'm only talking about four species that occur sympatrically. In our Thailand site, there are eight species that occur sympatrically. So in Northeast, I'll tell you, uh, because we have information from there, which we're giving as part of my PhD, we collect it. And uh, so the great hornbill mostly feeds on figs. The wreath hornbill mostly feeds on non figs. And the rufous neck is doing 50-50, right? So they partition and the kinds of fruits that they eat, number one. Second is the scale at which they track the fruits. So the wreath hornbill breeds in the low elevation forests in Burma, mostly. It flies into the high elevation forests in the winter. It actually shows reverse altitudinal migration. In altitudinal migration, birds move down in winters and they go up in the summers. Here, the wreath hornbill breeds in the lower elevations of the wind, in the summers, and it moves up in the winters. Because the fruit availability in the low elevations actually dips in the winter, in the mid elevation, it peaks in the winter. And so it is tracking fruits at a much larger scale. Right? The great hornbill and the rufous net hornbill track the fruits locally. Right? So, in fact, the great hornbill and the wheat hornbill that we tagged in Pake, two individuals, we tagged around the same time. Their nests were about 150 to 200 meters separated from them. So, they had access to similar fruit resources. But the great hornbill's home range was 2 square kilometers over the 3 months. The wreath hornbill's home range was 45 square kilometers. Right? Now, also this is implications on the other things that you see. So the only hornbill species that is found in the Papua New Guinea and those areas is the close relative of the Narcondam hornbill, which is a close relative of the wreath hornbill. Right? So there is a full lineage of hornbills. And all of those which are found in across the Wallace line and all that are the species which are closely related to wreath hornbill, which are basically tracking resources at very, very large scales. Right? So now the hornbill and the wreath and the great hornbill had access to the same resources, but yet the wreath hornbill ranges over 45 square kilometers in the same season. It's really uh, mind boggling. So clearly, it's not just the ecological proximate, it's also the ultimate drivers that are influencing the way they track, which also allows them to coexist. Right? And so the rufous net hornbill is tracking individual plants in the landscape. So the tree that is fruiting, it will go and start feeding. Wreath hornbill is tracking patches which have a lot of fruit. Because they're moving over large areas, they don't track individual trees. So it's not like if a tree has a lot of fruits, it will come there. It may come there, but a tree with a small, few fruits also, it may also visit. As long as the tree is in the patch that has a lot of food. So on wreath hornbill track patches. Rufus neck and great hornbill will track individual trees. So they will go to trees where there are more fruits. So there are multiple ways in which they are able to separate and coexist. By feeding on different things, by tracking resources at different scales. Right? Yeah. That is an interesting question. <laughs> Thanks. That the small birds do not take this. Do you think that if, like, if it's possible for us to exclude like the small fruit, do you think it's similar result or do you think it's similar? In Pake and Namdafa, you mean the mainland sites? Yeah, in the mainland sites. If, if because there are like small fruit, but if you do an exclusion experiment, instead of looking at like the uh, ecosystem that we are already in, which could have contributed to like various other factors. Do you think you will see an impact of small-body protein? Yeah. I would think that I would expect that the hornbills would start feeding on other things as well. That you typically don't see them feeding right now because there are other. So this was also something that, you know, it's like an example of, well, it, we can only hypothesize. These are observational studies and all that. These are, of course, you can't uh, really do this experiment, uh, what you're talking about, but you can only speculate about it. That's why we've chosen these sites also where we triangulate to what we're saying, right? So we were also really curious about it. You know, when we small frugivores go missing, what happens, right? And this is really cool stuff that we found really interesting stuff there. And it's got us excited. And we are now following up leads on those studies and all that. But going back to your question, yes, I would expect that they would start feeding on things that uh, are not there. Now, to give you another example, no? so we followed up on this study. So currently, in 
In fact, we've done doing a study, which is in Thailand, of course, where there are almost 60 species of frugivores. In Arcondam, where we have seven species of frugivores, Eastern Himalaya, there uh, these two sites that I spoke about with about 30 to 40. And in Valparai, we've done a study now. In Anamalai Tiger Reserve, there are about 20 species of frugivores. So now we've sampled across the full gradient in Western Himalaya also we have a site. So we've sampled seven or eight sites across the diversity of uh, the diversity gradient and all that. And in Andamans, what we are seeing, Andamans though has no hornbill, right? The main Andaman archipelago, where we is also our site, there is no hornbill there. There is an imperial pigeon. There is fairy blue bird. There is no barbet. There are bulbul, Andaman bulbul. So one species of bulbul, or probably two species of bulbul, red whiskered and Andaman bulbul. We have the imperial pigeon. We have the fairy blue bird, right? The imperial pigeon there, on Narcondam, it is not feeding on large seeded plant, only on ficus. In the mainland, where there are a lot of species, it is only focusing on large seeded plants. Right? In Andamans, they are they're feeding on both. So they are almost single handedly the most important seed dispersal for seeds of Meristica and all that. Very large seeds, right? Zyphal, no, nutmeg, we can talk about. And ficus also, we see them feeding. So clearly, you know, I think that there is a. The small bodied Fuji was also imposing a lot of uh, constraints on the way the large bodied Fuji was feeding. And uh, yeah, so even for example, on an Arcondam island, we feel that the hornbills are just hyper abundant. That's the highest density of hornbills in the world. The second highest is, of course, Namdafa, which is we're talking about 100. In Narcondam, it is 150 birds per square kilometer. It's just raining hornbills. It is just full of hornbills, that place. You know, it's just mind boggling that place. And so there we think that the pigeons are like, okay, hornbills, let them eat the large seeded. We will focus on the small seeded ones because ficuses also have large fruit crops and all that, right? But on the high, when hornbills are gone, I think the uh, pigeons are in the happiest place when there are very few small frugivores and there's no hornbill. So then it can feed on the large seeded and the small seeded. But these are all stories that I'm telling based on we have some data to, I'm backing that up with some data. So these are observations, but these are again not experiments, right? You would really need an experiment to pin down. But yeah. Yeah. So I just touch upon that, but uh, so for the hornbill, what you see, and this is for most species of fruit, was that of course the seed predators are there, right? I spoke about pigeons which destroy the seeds. Right now I'm talking about seed dispersers. So there will be a bunch of species that will actually benefit from the uh, gut passage, where their germination rates, germination success, right? So in within how many days does the seed germinate and how many, what percentage of seed germinate? Both of these are positively impacted. So the gut treatment, and it is amazing, you know, because this canarium fruit that I'm talking about, their guts are really fascinating. The canarium fruit, you know, if I give you the fruit, a ripe fruit, and humans also eat the fruit, so it's not like something that humans don't eat. If I give you the ripe fruit and I say that remove all the pulp in 150 minutes or 90 minutes and give it back to me, a clean seed like the one you saw in the picture, I bet that most people here won't be able to give as clean a seed as the hungry. And despite using our hands and everything, teeth and all that, we will not be able to give such a seed with no pulp at all. In 90 minutes, that uh, whole thing melts. The pulp melts literally in the gut and it disperses the seed. Right? And then, of course, so there is a lot of uh, chemical uh, exposure that the seeds are experiencing there. And also sometimes the movement itself, right? The way the seed gets processed from the gut and all that and all that. So physically and chemically, it gets a lot of uh, impetus to then, so that influences. But in a certain species of plants, not all. Yeah. So you were saying that Birds compartmentalize themselves and uh, they, they pick different types of fruits that they disperse. And one is in the mainland, uh, mostly disperse large seeds. But uh, is there any redundancy between mammals or goyal mammals and what is Because I suppose squirrels and primates should also have a larger game size. Yeah. So they could disperse the seeds that hornbills do. So is there a redundancy between? So squirrels normally either predate the seeds because sometimes you'll see them just removing the pulp and going for the seed. Seed like the canarium, they would just go for the seed. Giant squirrels, uh, just in November I was observing them in Valparai. They just go for the seed, ignore the, the pulp and all that. Then some seeds they will disperse. But remember, seeds of 
they will only disperse just beyond the canopy or they will just drop it below the parent tree squirrels primates of course they will disperse so uh, they will feed on fruits and they will disperse but then you have in tropical forests old world tropics at least or in uh, afro tropics in the asian, asian tropics there is a distinct community of plants which is dispersed by the primates and ungulates the fruit color itself is different so when the fruit ripens it is more greenish in color like a sister or a close relative of canarium strictum of course is canarium resiniferum the both species occur sympatrically canarium resiniferum ripe fruits are green we have hardly seen hornbills feed on that those are dispersed by barking deer and probably primates and then you have the canarium strictum which is black in color which is dispersed so yellow black red color fruits those are the ones which are typically dispersed by birds of course there is overlap and so primates also will over disperse some of the seeds that are also fed upon but it's a overlap so there are still lots of predominantly bird dispersed fruits yeah and also do you see uh, this like this canopy effect that you mentioned that uh, so is there a size difference between no, no? it's size similar same size more questions. My question. My question might be similar, but I have a question with the second in form of period mention. Are uh, comparably uh, injustice to the hypothesis because in the second part you have seen the uh, changes in very small evolutionary period. In the third uh, uh, third option you have seen that uh, the long evolutionary time you have given to the island. So can the comparison be made? Where the regeneration is not happening, right? So the seeds are not arriving and the regeneration is not happening. So basically, you have a patch of forest with their hornbills, and we show that hornbills are dispersing a lot of the seeds, and there is also a regeneration that is happening. Well, of course, I didn't show the regeneration results here for the benchmark site. Well, in the first part of it, I did show it in the later part of it. In the comparison, I did show that. The benchmark sites also had the less disturbed sites had greater recruitment, right? And so it is fine, no. So what there is no problem that it is happening in real time. Inside. In that point, you mentioned like how bigger to be was in the place of the smaller as well. Yeah, but that's a long evolutionary period you have given to that island. So the thing is that uh, within the prime, but uh, the point I would want to make there is there is dietary plasticity. So there is a bit of it that you know that Fuji was. Are able to uh, just showing dietary plasticity. That okay, if this frugivore is not there, let me focus on this and let me cap. That's what the argument that we make that there is dietary plasticity, so that they they are able to feed on large seeded plants as well and small seeded plants as well. But based on the concept context, they choose whether to for forage more because again the green imperial pigeon, right? Which I of course showed the pied imperial pigeon, but there is also green imperial pigeon. It's all the same genera. Green imperial pigeon is the same species which is there in northeast India also, right? And so it's the same species that we're talking about that are showing different things. It's clearly more or less to do with and green imperial pigeon on the Andaman archipelago is feeding on large seed plants, right? In Arcondam it is not feeding on large seed plants. And so there is a bit of we would I would rather attribute it to dietary plasticity that uh, they are able to feed on diverse things and they choose to feed on. Can we say that the second point you have given sufficient time maybe the smaller Oh, that way you're saying. Yeah. But then that time is there, no? Because many of these lineages are very old. Like the hornbills that we're talking about is 30 million years old, since the lineage ancestral lineage came into the South Asian forests. And so similarly, the bulbuls and all that, they in fact are more older. Those lineages have come from Australia, so they've got enough uh, time to evolve, no? So if a bulbul had to feed on large seeded plant. Was that? Am I getting a question? Not exactly bulbul, but a little larger uh, bird, compared okay. smaller than horn. Yeah. Yeah. So imperial yeah. pigeon would be that, right? Yeah. Imperial pigeon would be that, right? And then you have the C. There is also one thing that I want to show is that uh, barbets. No? I showed them as villains here. This is that poor dispersers and all that. But barbets are always active. They are picking fruits and all that, and they are feeding on these. Uh, they are trying to feed on these last seed plants. Similarly, hill mina is also coming and feeding on these last seed plants. So 
Coach was also trying to come and feed on the last week. Just that they end up dropping a lot of seeds. I mean, out in Atlantic forests in Brazil, right, they found that as because it was also fragmented and hunted, right, they found that the palm seed size within 70 or 80 years had declined. Because palms have relatively short uh, lifespans. And so what was happening is that with the loss of large bodied fugivores, the small bodied fuji was feeding on fruits with small seeds. Because in Narcondon also, there was one species of Keonanthus. The seed was the smallest seed that we got was this size, and the largest seed was this size. So there is a lot of variation in seed size. Right? And so in Atlantic forests, what they found was that with the loss of large bodied fuji, Small bodied Fuji was feeding on fruits of the same species with small seeds, right? Small size seeds, and they were getting dispersed and all that. And so the younger uh, lot of the palms, they typically had smaller fruits. So, historically, within 70 years, you've seen that there's a selection that has happened because of loss of large bodied Fuji, which is a very shift in seed size. And so, something like that potentially can happen, but see, for every barber that is trying to come and it is also to compete with the hornbill. Hanbir is also trying to chase away because they are also actively, if they come on large seed plants, they will chase away. They really look for these uh, large seed plants. A lot of lipid rich fruits and all that. So there's, barbets are caught in between. They have bulbuls from below and they have pigeons and hornbills from the top. So, uh, you know, but then of course there would be some bit of stuff happening there as well on evolutionary time scales. Last question. Uh, Maybe most of the hornbills are sacrificed because the gut studies and the anatomy is also required for differentiating the fecal matter. Uh -huh. uh, gut hornbills are? Because the gut studies and anatomy of hornbills are also required for differentiating the fecal matter falling on the floor, the floor of the hornbills. For the? Maybe uh, the hornbills are sacrificed, maybe some of the hornbills are sacrificed for studying the anatomy and the blood structure and physiology for this. They must have done, they, that has been done earlier only. You know? They have uh, dissected hornbills and all that for long because hornbills have been collected. If you go to any museums, they would have collections of hornbills. The physiology and all that is fairly, uh, well, the anatomy and all that is fairly well studied. For these birds and all that. But now people don't do it. You find dead animals in zoos and all that, those would be the ones that because most uh, zoos in Europe and US also would have uh, hornbills and all that. So once those animals die, would be used. But now they would not hunt hornbills. It's not easy. They are scheduled in India. It's in Wildlife Protection Act, Schedule One. So you cannot just hunt hornbills like that. But so in India, of course, it's difficult. But in zoos and all that, there would be potential opportunities for them. Also, one thing that I would tell you, you know, is that the great barbet, which is the largest barbet in Eastern Himalaya, is found in high elevations. Where their hornbills are relatively smaller in size. Ah, sorry, hornbills are relatively rarer. It's also a use. Well, we have a Thailand data. I have not looked at, analyzed the Thailand data completely. But Thailand also has a lot of barbets. Some of them are quite large in size. So it will also give us some interesting perspective on. These are all data sets that we are sitting on right now and we're slowly analyzing it. But we'll look, look at about you know, how the body size structure is. I showed you for the gap width for the Asian Eastern Himalayan one. We want to also look at how the Thailand one looks like, where there are more species of fuji. Okay. So those probably the intermediate size which was missing, you would see that probably in Thailand those are the the big size classes that are getting occupied or something. So there would be some information that probably would come out from there as well. Some insights probably. Yeah. Thanks. Interesting. Okay, so we'll wrap up now. Um, thank you, Rohit, for delivering such a beautiful talk. We have uh, we have a gift for you. Oh. <laughs> I'm so happy that you know to see Ulasa after a lot of time. So both of us first time we met first time we met was uh when all the game showed and uh Rohit had come with some people to school I was visiting so I was a driver. I took them around, show them some.